Flies van Rosenfeld was a peasant from Tollen, a small town in the Netherlands. Sometime in the 1640s, he set sail to the Dutch colony of New Netherland, in the city of New Amsterdam, a city which would soon change its name to New York. From then on, van Rosenfeld's descendants would live in the area around New York City. They would include two of the most influential presidents and one of the most prominent first ladies in American history. This is the story of how they got there. Welcome to That Is Interesting. Today, how the Roosevelts became a political dynasty. About a decade after arriving in New York, Clyde Van Roosevelt had made enough money to purchase 50 acres of land in Manhattan. Today, the Empire State Building sits on the land that used to belong to him. Van Roosevelt's son, Nicholas, changed his last name to the anglicized spelling of Roosevelt and became involved in local politics, serving as a city alderman. Nicholas had 10 children. Two of his sons, Johannes and Jacobus, would be the founders of two different branches of the Roosevelt family, known as the Hyde Park and Oyster Bay branches, named for the towns they lived in. Johannes became a successful businessman, earning a small fortune producing linseed oil, which is used as a pigment, varnish, and food. Johannes's descendants married into other wealthy New York families and established themselves as a part of the New York City elite. Through his own successful business ventures, as well as inheritance, Johannes's great-grandson, Cornelius Roosevelt, became the fifth richest man in New York, and purchased an estate in Oyster Bay, a coastal town on Long Island, for which his branch of the Roosevelt family would be named. Meanwhile, Johannes Roosevelt's nephew, Isaac, began a successful career of his own. He founded a sugar refining company, one of the largest in the city, and pursued a career in politics, serving as the president of the Bank of New York a delegate to the New York Constitutional Convention, and a member of the New York State Assembly. Isaac's son, James, followed in his father's footsteps, working in New York City politics, at the Bank of New York, and in the sugar refining business. In 1819, he bought a property near the Hudson River town of Hyde Park, which his branch of the family would be named after. For now, we will focus on Cornelius Roosevelt's descendants, the Oyster Bay branch of the family. Cornelius had six sons, one, like him, would become a successful banker, one would serve in the House of Representatives, and another, named Theodore Roosevelt Sr., would be a prominent New York philanthropist, founding the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the American Museum of Natural History, and the Children's Aid Society. He married Martha Bullock, a member of a wealthy Georgia family. They had four children, one of which was named Theodore Jr. Theodore Sr. was a strong supporter of the Union Army during the Civil War. However, his wife was Southern, and some of her brothers fought for the Confederacy. The war divided the Roosevelt household, and in the end, Theodore Sr. chose not to fight, as not to upset his wife, a decision he deeply regretted. Their son, Theodore Jr., grew up with a bad case of asthma. He fought to overcome the disease by spending much of his life outdoors, and exercising all the time. As a child, Theodore loved to collect different specimens of animals, and was very interested in becoming a naturalist. He idolized his father, but while he was away studying at Harvard, the elder Theodore passed away. Theodore Jr. inherited a large chunk of the Roosevelt family fortune upon his father's death. Interested in the Navy, he wrote a book on naval strategy in the War of 1812. Roosevelt then decided to pursue a career in government, winning a seat in the New York State Assembly, where he drew attention as a staunch advocate of anti-corruption measures. Shortly after, however, tragedy struck as Theodore's wife and mother died on the same day. Grieving, he fled to North Dakota, where he was able to breathe fresh air and ranch cattle. When he returned to New York, he developed a reputation as a cowboy. After he was remarried and ran an unsuccessful campaign for mayor of New York, Roosevelt was offered a job as president of the board of New York City Police Commissioners. In charge of the police department, Theodore made it his goal to crack down on corruption, patrolling the city at night to make sure officers weren't sleeping on the job. In 1896, Ohio Governor William McKinley was elected president. The new commander-in-chief appointed Theodore to be assistant secretary of the Navy. Little did Roosevelt know, in five years he would rise from that relatively minor position to be president of the United States. As assistant secretary of the Navy, Roosevelt saw tensions increase between Spain and rebels in its colony of Cuba. In February of 1898, those tensions reached a boiling point. One of the U.S. Navy's ships, the USS Maine, exploded. War was declared, 
Roosevelt resigned his position as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and headed to Cuba, where he led a group of cavalry known as the Rough Riders. Under his command, the Rough Riders won one of the war's most important battles, the Battle of San Juan Hill. This victory was a major turning point for Theodore Roosevelt. He went into it part of a wealthy family and a minor political appointee, but left a nationally recognized figure. After the war ended in August of 1898, Roosevelt used his military fame to mount a campaign for governor of New York. It was a close race, and Roosevelt won with just 1% over his opponent. As governor, Roosevelt began to develop his political ideals, such as conservation of natural areas, regulation of large companies, and opposition to monopolies and trusts. He had only been governor for less than two years, but people were already encouraging Theodore Roosevelt to run for president. He was more reluctant. As a Republican, running in the election of 1900 would mean challenging the current president, William McKinley, who was also a Republican, for the top spot on their party's ticket. It would be unlikely that he would be able to beat the incumbent president in the primaries, so he decided to wait until 1904 to mount a run. But in November of 1899, things changed. Garrett Hobart, the vice president, died of heart failure, and McKinley needed someone to run with. His supporters urged Roosevelt to take the job, as did his opponents, who hoped putting Theodore in the vice presidency would leave him in a pretty powerless position. Although skeptical, Roosevelt eventually accepted the position and became a fierce campaigner for McKinley, who won re-election, propelling Theodore to the vice presidency. But his time as vice president didn't last very long. Only a few months after the election, tragedy struck. While visiting the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, President McKinley was assassinated by an anarchist, making the 42-year-old Theodore Roosevelt the youngest president in U.S. history, a record he still holds. Only five years prior, Roosevelt had been a relatively unknown former state assemblyman. Since then, he'd experienced a rapid rise, becoming assistant secretary of the Navy, a national war hero, governor of New York, vice president, and then president. His presidency is considered one of the most influential in American history, and he's one of the presidents memorialized on Mount Rushmore. He created the U.S.'s first national parks, built the Panama Canal, regulated large companies and broke up trusts, as well as negotiated an end to war between Russia and Japan. He was also a leader of the progressive movement, and his presidency made progressive ideas more mainstream in each party. In 1904, Roosevelt was elected for another term, but declined to run for a third. This was before the United States had term limits. No president had ever won a third term, but Roosevelt probably could have if he had run. He decided instead to back his good friend and Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, who easily won in 1908. But Roosevelt was frustrated by his successor's lack of progressivism and decided to run against Taft for the Republican nomination in 1912. After a narrow defeat in the primaries, Roosevelt created his own party, the Progressive or Bull Moose Party. He actually got more votes in that election than Taft, but the success of his third party candidacy, the most successful third party run in American history, was not enough for Roosevelt to beat Democratic candidate Woodrow Wilson. He died soon after leaving behind the beginning of one of America's most successful political dynasties. Nearly a century earlier, Theodore's distant cousin James Roosevelt purchased a property in the Hudson River town of Hyde Park. His grandson, also named James, was a wealthy heir and businessman. James married Sarah Delano, the daughter of a rich merchant, and had only one child, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin grew up in Hyde Park. He was 19 years old when his fifth cousin, Theodore was elected president. After graduating college, he married Theodore's niece, Eleanor, and began following in his distant cousin's footsteps, winning a seat in the New York State Senate in 1910. Unlike his fifth cousin, however, Franklin was a Democrat. After Roosevelt had served in the state Senate for just two years, New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson won the 1912 presidential election, beating both William Howard Taft and Theodore Roosevelt. After his inauguration, the new president appointed his former rival's Democratic cousin to be his assistant secretary of the Navy. While this was no major position, it had a symbolic significance. Theodore Roosevelt ascended to the presidency just five years after his appointment to the same job. Now, with another young Roosevelt in the same position, it was clear Franklin was an up-and-coming figure in American politics. 
1914, after just one year as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, news broke that New York Senator Elihu Root would not seek another term. 32-year-old Franklin decided to mount a campaign, but it was not to be. Lacking support from prominent New York politicians, Roosevelt lost in the Democratic primary. Back as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin had important work to do. World War I had begun, and he played a large role in production and deployment of U.S. ships. After the war ended in 1918, the 1920 election season was beginning. Wilson's two terms were up, and Roosevelt saw a path to the Democratic ticket. The young but unknown politician with a famous name could run as the vice presidential nominee to one of the most well-liked people in America. Herbert Hoover was a businessman who had served as the head of the U.S. Food Administration and had helped rebuild Europe after the end of the war. Roosevelt saw Hoover as a potential candidate and pitched the idea of a Hoover-Roosevelt ticket to him. But when Hoover announced his much-anticipated bid for the presidency, it was as a Republican, not a Democrat, all but ending that possibility. Hoover ended up losing the Republican nomination anyway to Ohio Senator Warren Harding. The winner of the 1920 Democratic primary was James Cox, the governor of Ohio. For his running mate, Cox made a surprising choice, asking the 38-year-old Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Roosevelt accepted, resigned from his post, and began campaigning. But by the end of Woodrow Wilson's eight years, the Democratic Party had lost popularity, and voters were ready for a change. Cox and Roosevelt were defeated in a landslide, winning only 34% of the popular vote. Warren Harding became president. Not even 40 years old, Roosevelt had come just one election away from holding the second most powerful position in the country. But the Democratic Party's young rising star would soon be forced out of politics by disease. Just a year after his electoral defeat, Franklin was diagnosed with polio. He became paralyzed from the waist down and forced into a wheelchair. Many consider this the end of his career, but he was intent that it would not be. He learned to walk across short intervals with a cane and built a polio treatment center in Georgia. After seven years of recovery, it was an election year again. New York's governor, Al Smith, had received the Democratic nomination for president and asked Franklin to run for the open spot. Smith was running against Herbert Hoover, the popular head of the Food Administration, who had gone on to serve as Secretary of Commerce under President Harding. Smith lost to Hoover in a landslide defeat, but Franklin had a little more luck winning the governorship of New York in his own landslide. His wife, Eleanor, was a close advisor and began building her own political agenda, creating a name for herself as a public figure. Not even a year after being elected governor, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began. As governor, Roosevelt implemented economic relief programs, while on the national scale, President Hoover did not, hoping the Depression would eventually subside. Roosevelt was easily re-elected for a second two-year term, but at this point, the New York governor had presidential aspirations. The last three presidents, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, had all been Republicans. But due to his failure to end the Great Depression, Hoover was quickly losing popularity. Promising policies that would help the U.S. economy recover, which he called the New Deal, Roosevelt won an overwhelming victory, with Hoover winning only six states in the Electoral College. On March 4, 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was inaugurated the 32nd President of the United States and became the second member of the Roosevelt family to hold that high office. Like Theodore, Franklin Roosevelt is widely considered one of the most influential American presidents. He was incredibly popular and connected on a personal level to many Americans, a popularity reflected in his unprecedented election to four terms in office. He was the only president to serve more than two, residing in the White House for 12 years. His early years as president were marked by policies aimed to help pull the country out of the Great Depression, and in his later years, he led the country through most of World War II, forming a powerful alliance with Churchill and Stalin to successfully defeat the forces of Germany and Japan. Historians often rank FDR as America's third best president, after Lincoln and Washington. On April 12, 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt died at the beginning of his fourth term in office, and his vice president, Harry Truman, succeeded him as president of the United States. His wife, Eleanor, also played a major role in American history. She was a close advisor to her husband and spoke out in support of civil rights and women's rights, writing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
chairing the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women and serving as America's first ever delegate to the United Nations. She is remembered as one of America's most influential first ladies. Franklin, Theodore, and Eleanor were not the only Roosevelts to have a life in politics. Two of Franklin and Eleanor's children, James and Franklin Jr., served in Congress, and Theodore Roosevelt's son, Theodore Jr., went to serve as governor of Puerto Rico in the Philippines. Theodore's great-granddaughter, Susan Roosevelt, is married to former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld. The Roosevelt political family even holds office in countries besides the United States. Theodore's cousin's great-great-granddaughter, Theodora Roosevelt Clark, was elected in 2019 to the British Parliament. I hope you enjoyed this look into one of America's most influential political dynasties, because more will be coming soon. I learned a lot about the Roosevelt family through reading a book called The Roosevelts, An Intimate History, written by Jeffrey C. Ward and Ken Burns. If you want a more in-depth look into this fascinating family, I definitely recommend you give it a read. Thank you for watching this video and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.